So it's a very great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, uh, Dr. Noel Klinger. Uh, he earned a Bachelor of Science in Physics at American University and recently received his PhD in Astrophysics from George Washington University. His research is focused on pulsars. A pulsar is a magnetized spinning neutron star, quote, star in quotes there, that resulted from the gravitational <coughs> collapse of a star somewhat more massive than the sun. Strictly speaking, neutron stars are not stars at all. Uh, they're remnants of former stars that were too massive to collapse to a white dwarf, but not massive enough to collapse to a black hole. They produce remarkable phenomena, besides the supernovae that uh, signal their birth, in, in addition to the pulses of beam radiation that give some of them the name pulsar. One of those remarkable phenomena is the pulsar wind nebula, uh, a phenomenon which we've only begun to understand relatively recently. So we're going to find out about them. All right. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming to my talk. Uh, before I begin, I just want to say, if anything in my talk is unclear at any point, don't hesitate to raise your hand and ask a question right there and then, because chances are other people are wondering the same thing. I'd rather have everyone on the same page as me, and I also like talking to the audience. So, participation is encouraged. So, a uh, brief outline of my talk. I will begin with the history of neutron stars and the first discovery. I'm going to have to go through a little bit of physics and background as to what they are, how they work, and how they're formed. Uh, some basics about pulsars, like where the wind comes from, how they produce pulsations, uh, how we study pulsar nebulae, and then finally, the interesting things that they can do. So, uh, theoretical origins. In 1931, uh, these brilliant physicists, Lev Landau, Niels Bohr, and Leon Rosenfeld discussed uh, the possible existence of stars as dense as atomic nuclei. And Landau later published a paper on this. Uh, at the time, that was a pretty crazy idea because the neutron hadn't even been discovered until the following year. Uh, so they're already like proposing neutron stars before neutrons are even known to exist. Uh, later in 1965, a PhD student by the name of Jocelyn Bell and her advisor, Anthony Hewish, built a uh, radio telescope to scan the sky and discover new sources. This was uh, in the infancy of radio astronomy, so much of the sky hadn't even been covered. Everything that they found was pretty much new at that point. Uh, Bell discovered a radio source called CP1919. Its the name was from its position in the sky. And she noticed it pulsated regularly at 1.33 seconds. And no one had ever seen anything like that before. At first, her advisor thought it was some kind of like man-made thing, like radio interference. But Jocelyn Bell proved that it wasn't because it didn't follow changes in time zones or the change of sidereal day. Because sidereal days are four days shorter than our clocks, and that's why you see different constellations in the winter sky at night than you do in the summer sky at night. So it was proven to be real. Uh, this is the uh, graphing paper that the source was noticed on back then. The, uh, the data was recorded with ink and paper, and uh, she noticed this abnormality in the circle here. Uh, as they discussed it with colleagues, they kind of jokingly nicknamed it LGM1, short for Little Green Men 1, because they uh, had to seriously consider the possibility that might be aliens. No one had ever saw a star pulsate regularly and at such a short, like almost man-made, human kind of time scale. Uh, Hewish was later awarded the Nobel Prize, but Jocelyn Bell wasn't recognized and that wasn't right. But uh, in the following years, more of these pulsating stars were discovered, one of which is at the center of the Young Crab Nebula, which is a supernova remnant. This is an optical image, and uh, here, slowed down, is another uh, time-based optical image, slowed down by a factor of 60, but you can see the pulse of the pulsar, but it has a main pulse and an off pulse. But uh, I saw a talk by Jocelyn Bell in January, and she uh, was telling me that she almost wasn't the first person to discover pulsars, because uh, uh, after she discovered them, people wrote to her, and one of them was an amateur astronomer who uh, swore he saw flickering, like fast pulsing pulsations in the Crab Nebula, and 
told other people and they didn't think it was real or thought it was some kind of electronic effect. And so that no one followed it up. But I guess the point of this is uh, anyone can make incredible discoveries. So if you see something interesting, even if you think it's fake, don't hesitate to follow it up. Um, so uh, in order to understand where pulsars come from, we need to briefly talk about the stellar life cycle. Uh, so pulsars are formed from stars roughly between 8 to 10 solar masses. You know, sun-like stars, like our own, will eventually become a red giant, and they'll kind of peacefully shed their outer layers and form a planetary nebula. And it has nothing to do with planets, but back in the days, the 1800s, when telescopes were really crude, people thought they could have been other planets because they couldn't resolve the planet structure here. Anyway, uh, larger stars become red giants and possibly even blue giants, and then they'll collapse and explode the supernovae, and that is where you get pulsars and neutron stars from. Uh, larger stars might uh, collapse into black holes. Uh, the contrast isn't that great here, sorry about that. But, uh, and even larger stars we've discovered can just directly collapse in a black hole, and even the largest ones will actually just evaporate themselves because they produce so much energy. So uh, the insides of stars are hot, as I'm sure you all are aware. Hot enough, in fact, that the particles inside move so fast that they can slam into each other and overcome the electromagnetic repulsion uh, of protons. So hydrogen forms into helium, and helium can also fuse into heavier elements, and that's where most of the elements that aren't hydrogen and helium that we're made out of come from. Uh, this releases energy, mostly in the form of photons, which in this case are gamma rays, but also as neutrinos and sometimes even positrons. So in the center of the star, you have fusion going, and this fusion produces heat. Uh, the radiation pressure uh, keeps the star inflated. It counteracts the star's gravity, which would otherwise cause it to collapse. But uh, as the star is burning its fuel, it stays in equilibrium for the most part. Uh, stars, after the run out of hydrogen, will start fusing heavier elements. Uh, and larger stars will fuse even progressively progressively heavier elements uh, in different layers. Uh, fusion will stop once the star starts producing iron. And that is because iron is a dead end for fusion. Uh, when you fuse iron, no energy is released. And in fact, if you're going to fuse elements higher than iron, it actually consumes energy. Uh, likewise, the reverse process is true. If you split elements heavier than iron, it releases energy. And that is the basis of nuclear power in the form of fission. <coughs> So uh, once stars have burnt up everything up until iron, and the core starts, uh, an iron core starts growing in the center of the star. Now, uh, eventually this iron core will reach uh, a special limit called the Chandrasekhar limit, which is 1.44 times the mass of our sun. Uh, at this point, something special happens. Uh, the gravity of that iron core uh, exerts more pressure than the electrons can keep up. So the electrons get compressed into the protons and they fuse to form neutrons. Uh, neutrons have no charge, they're neutral, so they don't repel each other. So what used to be a large core will get compressed down into a very small area. Uh, in fact, most of atoms like are empty space. For example, if uh, a basketball was the size of an atomic nucleus, the electron cloud would be about a couple of miles out in each direction. So almost most of that is empty space, but neutrons can be compact really densely. Uh, if you pile even more neutrons onto this, eventually the neutrons can't even prevent themselves from, from collapsing in the form of black hole. Anyway, um, so uh, once this mass, 1.4 solar masses is reached, the core will collapse instantly in a fraction of a second. Uh, so now you have uh, these unsupported stellar layers. So they'll obviously fall inward, and they hit the core at 20% the speed of light. That heats things up really hot, billions of Kelvin, like unimaginable temperatures. Uh, now this iron core, or collapsed iron core, which is now a ball of neutrons, is very incompressible and rigid. So anything that falls into it is going to hit it and bounce outward. Uh, so the outer layers all fall in, and the as they're bouncing out, most of the star's outer layers gets violently exploded outward, and that is a core collapse, or type two supernova. And now the collapsed uh, core forms what we call a neutron star. It's basically a giant ball of neutrons. 
Uh, now, these type 2 supernovae are extremely energetic, some of the most energetic things that can occur in the universe. Uh, in a matter of seconds, it will release 10 to the 44 joules. And for reference, that is more energy than our sun will emit over its 10 billion year lifetime, emitted in a matter of seconds. Uh, it can outshine entire galaxies for days or even months. Uh, right here is a picture of a galaxy before a supernova, and then this is during. And I don't even know if you can see the contrast here, but you can definitely see the supernova. They were very bright. Uh, in fact, if our sun was to go supernova right now, which it won't, thankfully, it would be brighter, even like nine light minutes away from us, than it would be if you detonated an atomic bomb right in front of your face. So they're very energetic events. Uh, supernovae also produce a lot of elements heavier than iron, uh, and that's where almost all elements heavier than iron that make us up come from. Uh, and they eject it back out into the interstellar medium in what we call uh, recycling. Uh, in fact, uh, every atom that makes up our solar system that isn't hydrogen or helium was produced in a supernova somewhere else in the galaxy. And most atoms have even gone through two or three supernovae. So we're literally made of stardust here. Uh, so, neutron stars, these are matter at the extreme. Any more extreme, and physics just stops and you have a black hole. Uh, they're compact, about 12 miles across. This is Manhattan for reference, and if a neutron star was here, that's about how big it would be to scale. So, in a matter of a couple of miles, you have as much masses as one and a half suns or 500,000 Earth masses. They're very dense. A teaspoon of this stuff is way more than a mountain, and they're hot like tens of millions of degrees. So uh, neutron stars are so dense that they can warp the space-time around them. And here's where you get into like general relativity effects. Uh, for example, if you could paint a neutron star with like a checker, the poles, uh, the checkerboard pattern, the poles would be here, and you could actually see past them because the light on the far side would get uh, bent back at you. So at any time, you could see more than half of the surface. Um, and we can actually like experimentally verify this with uh, very certain X-ray telescopes. But um, so, uh, an important concept to understand how pulsars work here is the concept of angular momentum. So, uh, when you have an object that spins, if you compress it or its radius decreases, its rotation rate will increase. So, you have a large star about a million kilometers across, and they rotate on the time scale of weeks, maybe months. Uh, when it collapses in a neutron star, this is, you know, the size of a neutron star, it actually be smaller than this, and this would be like the size of the sun. Uh, you're compressing it by a factor of like 10 to the 5. So its rotation rate will increase by a massive factor, 10 to the 10. Uh, so their formation from core collapse makes them uh, spin extremely rapidly. At birth, they usually spin around at 30 times per second. There's another effect that comes into play here called conservation of magnetic flux. Um, all <coughs> stars have magnetic fields which are represented by the lines, and the lines uh, represent the density of the magnetic field. Uh, when the star collapses, these field lines can't go away, they just get bunched up into each other. So now you have uh, an increase in the magnetic field. Uh, they produce magnetic fields between 10 to the 12 and 10 to the 15 gauss. Uh, what does that really mean? For comparison, here are some everyday objects in the magnetic fields. Uh, Earth is about half a gauss. A refrigerator magnet, which can overcome gravity, is about 50 gauss. Uh, an MRI machine is 20,000. A large Hadron Collider, about 83,000. And the most powerful magnetic field we ever created, which ended up destroying the laboratory that was produced in, is 7 million. But neutron stars are operating here at around a quintillion gauss. So, uh, to recap, they're basically powerful spinning magnets. Uh, they're very hot, so everything on their surface, they're not entirely um, neutrons, uh, gets ionized, turned into plasma. And changing magnetic fields, spinning magnets produce electric fields. And now electric fields accelerate charged particles. So, uh, charged particles follow magnetic field lines. That's why you get the aurora at the north and south pole, because all the field lines converge in that point. Uh, now, accelerating charges uh, emit radiation. In this case, accelerating could mean changing their course. So as uh, charged particles uh, gyrate along magnetic field, they release, uh, they emit photons, <coughs> radiation. So the neutron star magnetic field lifts plasma from the surface near the poles. The plasma follows the magnetic field line 
and it emits radiation. And that causes a beam of radio waves to be emitted out of their uh, magnetic pole. So as the neutron star spins, this radio beam, yeah, oh, sorry. What exactly causes the neutron What exactly causes it magnetic field? So inside, it's not entirely neutrons. There's lots of unpaired, like, protons and electrons scattered about that didn't get fused with each other. So the unpaired ions that are floating around and stuck in the center is what gives its, its magnetic field. So um, this radio beam sweeps around. And if the radio beam just happens to cross the Earth's path, we will see pulses at regular intervals. Uh, so a pulsar is definition, just any neutron star from which we see pulsations. Uh, that's the difference between the two. So if I use the term neutron star and pulsar interchangeably, this is the only real difference between them. Uh, you can think of them like cosmic lighthouses. Uh, why do we care about pulsars? Uh, they let us study general relativity. Um, you know, if two pulsars are orbiting each other, uh, they will uh, fall inward and emit energy as gravitational radiation as special, uh, sorry, general relativity predicts. Uh, it's related to quantum mechanics because how they cool and the rate at which they emit their thermal energy is based on what happens in their core, which we don't really know because we can't get matter at those densities and energies on Earth. Uh, their uh, immense magnetic fields are uh, conditions we can't replicate here on Earth. Uh, and they also pump plasma out into our galaxy. Uh, they're cool, in my opinion, because they're basically antimatter factories, which I'll talk about in the following slides. Uh, and thinking into the future, because they rotate very regularly uh, for interstellar travel, they could be used as like an interstellar global positioning system. So, uh, the population of neutron stars. In the last 50 years, we've discovered about 2,700 of them, most of which are pulsars and most of which reside in our galaxy. Most of them are pulsars because unless we see the pulses, they're very hard to discover. Uh, you know, if no pulsing beam of radiation is crossing the Earth's line of sight, it's hard to distinguish whatever it is from, like, it could be a hot star or something. Uh, there's many different types of subcategories of neutron stars. There's rotation-powered pulsars, which convert their immense rotational kinetic energy into electromagnetic radiation in a particle wind. And those can produce pulsar nebulae. Those are what I'm going to talk about. You also have accretion-powered pulsars, uh, which power themselves by stealing matter from their companion star. Either like they'll directly pull matter off, or they'll collect the wind of massive stars. And then you have magnetars, which are kind of weird pulsars, mag magnetic fields a thousand times stronger, and they generate all. The, they usually rotate much slower, but they generate their energy by um, by the decay of their magnetic field, and you can convert magnetic energy into radiation and they produce a lot of powerful outbursts. Yes? Can you explain something about the, the, the extent, the, the decay in the magnet stars? Yeah. So um, uh, just like electric fields, magnetic fields have an energy density associated with them. And uh, in certain conditions, if you compress the magnetic field or tangle it up, the magnetic field can reconfigure. And when it reconfigures, it kind of snaps into its new configuration. It wants to take on the lowest energy state, and it'll release a lot of that energy by accelerating plasma to new these fields. There's always a magnetic re reconnection. reconnection. Yes. Even though the underlying thing is time reversal invariant. But, okay, but the solutions are not time reversal invariant. Uh, I believe so. You can oh, only okay. really have That's these. really clever. Yeah. Uh, I'm not an expert in reconnection events, but um, they always involve some kind of plasma around. All right. So... We, we have a plasma physicist with us tonight. Oh, nice. Jack. Yeah, you, you need some plasma there, you need some resistivity. Yeah. So, I, I must say, I, this, is, yeah. this is the clearest explanation of neutron stars I've ever seen in my entire life. Thank you. This I'm is really, really excellent. I'm glad it's making sense. So, I'm going to talk about uh, rotation powered pulsars. Uh, <coughs> so, Pulsar winds. We're, we're getting there, guys. We're almost the fun part. Um, just like our sun and all stars, pulsars emit the wind of charged particles, but they are far more energetic. In fact, uh, a little pulsar can emit 120,000 times more energy than our sun puts out every second, despite being a small fraction of its size. 
So their immense magnetic field can produce accelerating potentials like on the order of a quintillion volts. So uh, this can accelerate electrons and give them about a billion times more energy than their rest mass energy is equal to. Now, when you have immense magnetic fields, uh, the photons that are emitted by these electrons can actually uh, undergo exotic uh, reactions and create pairs of matter and antimatter in the form of electrons and positrons. So like an electron that's lifted off the surface and it's a photon, that photon interacts with the magnetic field and creates a positron and an electron, matter and antimatter. Uh, if I, in the future, refer to electrons or charged particles, I'm always talking about uh, electrons and positrons, uh, just through reference. So, uh, and this, this diagram is showing that one seed initial electron that gets lifted off from the surface can end up producing a thousand times more electrons and positrons uh, in what we call a particle cascade. Uh, and the reason, uh, I forgot to mention that, the reason this happens is because uh, E equals mc squared, energy can be converted to mass and vice versa. So, the magnetosphere gets filled with plasma, electrons and positrons, and, uh, oh, uh, sorry, a, a question. question. Um, um, the, the electrons that get accelerated, uh, are they, they just from the, the, um, the, the, the random population of the, the electrons and protons that, that, that never combined to form neutrons? Yeah. So uh, on the surface of the neutron star, you actually have a lot of iron left over. Okay. Not 100% of the matter gets converted into neutrons. So the iron is fully ionized. And then wow. for each iron atom, you'll have 23 electrons just floating around because they're too energetic to stay bound to the atom. So uh, some of you might be wondering, uh, how can pulsars emit wind if charged particles are confined to following the magnetic field lines? And this is uh, where relativity comes into place. Uh, there is something called the light cylinder here. And special relativity, as I'm sure you guys have heard, states that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, which is c. So as this neutron star rotates, the field lines rotate around with it, at the, and they, they always stay connected. But that means that at some distance away from the neutron star, the field lines would have to be rotating at the speed of light in order to stay connected. Beyond that point, they can't rotate at the speed of light, so they lag behind, and those field lines will never end up closing with their return field line on the other side. Uh, at this point, it's called the light cylinder. Uh, beyond the light cylinder, the magnetic field lines just never end. They don't ever return and close back, as we're used to thinking magnets do. That means that plasma traveling along these open field lines can escape. So, uh, pulsars, pulsar nebulae are basically pressure can find outflows of electrons and positrons traveling outward from the pulsar at nearly the speed of light. Uh, this is an x-ray image of the crab pulsar <coughs> nebula. At the center you have the pulsar, and streaming away from the pulsar are these electrons and positrons. Uh, now, at some distance from the pulsar, the wind starts to pile up and feel the effect of the other wind around it. And the best analogy I can think of is a sink and a faucet. You know, the water comes down here, and initially the water in a faucet travels in straight lines away, but then it kind of creates that barrier, the ring around it, and the water starts to follow uh, turbulent paths. Okay, the same thing happens, or a very similar thing happens, with the electrons that stream out from the pulsar. At, this, at a certain distance, they start to pile up and feel the pressure from all the other electrons at a point called the termination shock. At that point, the field lines, magnetic field lines, become all tangled and randomly oriented in all different directions, and so is the particle's motion. So they're just kind of swirling around here, still moving outward on average at high speeds, but their motion is kind of random. Uh, at that point, they gyrate in the magnetic field and they emit radiation that we can see. That's why you see this inner ring around here, uh, because before that, particles aren't gyrating and they're not emitting radiation. So, uh, you might be uh, overloaded with information here, but uh, the key points to recap are, think of pulsars as spinning magnets uh, that convert the rotational energy into electromagnetic radiation and a particle wind uh, that will cause pulsars to lose energy over time. And now these particles, as they radiate uh, and give off energy, uh, they will also lose their energy over time. So, uh, pulsar winds are very energetic. Um, for example, some pulsars can even uh, can actually evaporate and literally destroy their companion stars 
if they orbit too close to each other. Uh, this is an animation showing that uh, as the neutron star's beam of particles sweeps across its companion star, it heats up and just obliterates it. And uh, they call Black Widow pulsars after the spider Black Widow because they kill their mates after mating. But um, it's just an example. So, how do we observe pulsar nebulae? Uh, the winds they create usually radiate across the entire electromagnetic spectrum, but they're best observed between radios, uh, sorry, in radio and in X-rays. Uh, I'm going to show you guys an example of a young, bright, and energetic pulsar nebula called 3C58. Uh, radio is good because there are a few, very few background sources. You know, not many stars emit primarily radio. And uh, so you get a high signal to noise ratio. You can see the emission from the wind. Uh, when you get to the uh, infrared optical and ultraviolet uh, regime, if you've ever seen a picture of the night sky, there are tons of stars. And most stars emit primarily in this range. So this is the picture of the nebula in the uh, infrared. This is considered a good detection, even though in my opinion it's barely visible. There's about a million stars just contaminating the you know, field. Uh, in optical, uh, also you get absorption. Uh, space is in a vacuum, there's lots of gas and dust floating around our galaxy, and it can absorb the light. Uh, uh, what well, you get is an x rays, the you effects of absorption it. are so less kind of instrument uh, that makes prominent, memory, so, so you can just get the full emission that's emitted towards you. Uh, and this is what it looks like in x rays, you can really see the feature. Uh, gamma rays aren't really good for studying uh, pulsar nebulae because gamma rays are very energetic, they can't be focused. So any kind of instrument that makes images of gamma rays has really bad resolution. Uh, this, this would be about the size of one pixel in gamma rays, so the negative would just seem like an amorphous blob, and you wouldn't even what's going on. So um, most of the images I'm going to show are going to be X-rays. Now, how we study them? Like I said before, you have these particles driving along magnetic fields, and they release uh, radiation. We call this synchrotron radiation. Uh, and it's not thermal radiation. You know, most things glow because they're hot, but these particles glow because they're energetic. There's not really a temperature that's associated with it. Uh, my, uh, probably the best telescope uh, design that can resolve all sorts of is the Chandra X ray Observatory. It's not the most sensitive, but it has the best resolution, so you can really make out all the fine, small features that uh, all sorts have. Uh, this is in orbit because our atmosphere absorbed X rays. It's good for us because it prevents us from getting cancer, but it's bad for X-ray astronomers because we can only use space-based telescope. Now, uh, X-rays are about like a thousand times, ten thousand times more energetic than the light particles that we see. So this lets the telescope record every individual photon that hits it. So it records the time, the energy of each particle, and the location from which it comes from. So we can make a false color image. Uh, here I just made a lower energy photons corresponding to red, uh, green, and the middle energy ones, and then blue would be the most energetic. Uh, from these images, you can uh, study or extract the spectrum from different regions. Uh, what is the spectrum? Uh, the spectrum is simply the number of photons uh, at a certain energy. So it's really the distribution of light that's coming from the source. Uh, what that would be like to us, in analogy, would be color. You know, uh, we see spectrum of things that we like as color. You know, take a fire, for example. The hottest part of the fire is blue, because it's made mostly blue photons. And the cooler parts, less energetic, are releasing red light, mostly because red is less energetic. So we can see the spectrum of the thing cool. And likewise, uh, using software, you can watch how the spectrum of particles cools as they radiate their energy off. Uh, and I say cool to uh, you know, lose energy, but again, there's no temperature really associated with these things. So, uh, these two main types of pulsar nebulae. The first type is those inside supernova remnants. Uh, the most famous example is the Crab Nebula. Now, this is the remnant of a star that exploded in 1024 AD. Uh, the ancient Chinese recorded a guest star in the sky. Uh, which may even saw during the day. In fact, it outshone the moon in the day sky, despite the fact that it was 6,500 light years away. So now when we point the Hubble Space Telescope at it, this is what we see. Uh, and what we're looking at here is mostly the filaments, the uh, 
ejecta of the star that was expelled when it exploded. Uh, orange is hydrogen, and blue is oxygen, green is silicon, and the darker red is like doubly ionized oxygen. Anyway, uh, if you'll notice, there's like a central kind of blue glow here. And what that is, is hints of the non thermal synchrotron emission from the pulsar wave particles. If you were to look at this in x rays, this is what you would see uh, about the same scale. So, um, the most prominent thing you'll notice here is that pulsar winds are anisotropic. They uh, exhibit axial symmetry, and this reflects the pulsar's spin geometry and orientation. Uh, for example, here you'll notice there's a jet of particles coming out here and uh, rings coming out from the equatorial region. Uh, so, you know, the radio beams rotate around the spin axis, but along the spin axis, particles are launched outward. And also, as I've said before, particles can escape from the open field lines, mostly in the equatorial direction. So uh, common features in pulsar nebulae are uh, a torus and uh, jets. Uh, also, nebulae can be variable. Uh, not many things uh, in the astronomical world vary on time scales that we can see, because they're all such long lived. But if we look at the crab, we can see wisps of this plasma moving outward at a fraction of the speed of light, about uh, one third actually. Uh, however, the optical wisps are moving at different speeds than the ones in X-ray. We don't really know why. Uh, and uh, let me play this video again. But just for scale, that inner ring here, the termination shock I was talking about, is about a light year in diameter. So these structures are pretty large. Uh, another variable pulsar nebula is the vela. Uh, its outer jet resembles like a rotating corkscrew. Uh, it kind of rotates on a period of about 120 days, and the blobs in the jet move outward at 70% speed of light. Now we're not. 100% sure what causes this. There are two main possibilities. One is that the jets are just unstable and they naturally kink up as they're moving outwards. And if you're like shot, can a silly string, silly string does the same thing. It comes out fast initially, but then it starts to curl up and tangle before you even hit something. Uh, or it could be that the pulsar itself is processing like a top, in which case the pulsar is spinning around this way, but the axis of interpretation is slowly changing. And that has a lot of interesting implications because that would mean that one, neutron stars aren't spherical. They would have to be more of like a weird or long shape. And that would also mean that pulsars would emit sources, uh, they'd be sources of gravitational waves. Uh, we discover them right now and you know two neutron stars or two black holes or a combination of them fall into each other. But in the future we're gonna have space-based gravitational wave systems like lasers that shine each other from like thousands of miles apart, that will increase our sensitivity to gravitational waves by thousands, factors of thousands, and we will be able to detect the waves from pulsars. So uh, here's another pulsar nebula inside a supernova remnant. This one is 16,000 light years away, about 2,000 years old. It's young. Uh, you see this shell injected around it. Uh, the orange and green, the, the thermal emission, the still hot stellar material is glowing even 2,000 years later. And uh, in blue, uh, again, I'm just assigning colors to these things. It's not actually blue because all of this is x rays. Uh, and this is just, I changed the color to enhance certain features, but right now the colors don't mean anything. But you can see some pulsar nebulae later dominated by jets rather than a torus. Uh, and here's another helical jet. Um, this is a really interesting, uh, to, this is one of the prettiest pictures I wanted to, uh, I'll try to spray it. Well, uh, I don't know, but uh, this one's called the Hand of God Nebula because it looks like a giant cosmic hand stretching that way. Uh, it's 17,000 light years away, but it's pretty young. Uh, so you have in blue the relativistic pulse of wind, uh, and it shoots out a long jet here. It's one of the longest ones we've ever seen. It stretches on for about 21 light years. Uh, and we can't really see the other jet, but we know it's colliding with this uh, gas cloud here. 
and the jet is the pulsar wind particles are colliding into the jet and heating them up to like millions of Kelvin, such that they're glowing in X-rays, which we can see. And uh, there's kind of a circular pattern here in this cloud, which might indicate that this pulsar is also processing too. Uh, uh, the contrast is a little bit better. You can see that there's a couple of finger-like structures, but we actually don't know what causes those. Uh, and if you zoom in, uh, you can see this one also has a termination shock, which, which is visible. And these are quite rare. I actually just showed you the only three times we've ever, ever resolved the termination shock. You only see them in very young and energetic pulsars because as they uh, age, pulsars emit less energy per second, and the termination shock gets smaller and smaller until you can't differentiate it from the bright central glow of the pulsar itself. But, so, uh, pulsars eventually escape their supernova limits. Uh, supernovae are not symmetric. Uh, they impart pulsars with birth kicks because they don't explode uniformly. Uh, pulsars get kicked and then in speeds of about 400 kilometers per second. Uh, on average, uh, the fastest one on fire around 1600 kilometers per second. That's really fast. What that means is that after about 10,000 to 50,000 years, depending on the speed of the pulsar and the size, it'll leave its supernova limit. And uh, pulsar and nebulae in the interstellar medium are much different than how they operate inside. Uh, the main parameter that determines what the pulsar and nebula will look like is the Mach number. And that is just simply the pulsar speed divided by the speed of the sound in the interstellar medium. Uh, so inside supernova remnants, the sound speed is very high, like tens of thousands of kilometers per second. Uh, so pulsars, in those cases, are subsonic. And that means that all of their features are totally unaffected by their fast motion. Outside the uh, supernova remnant, in the interstellar medium, the sound speed is much smaller, around 1 to 30-ish kilometers per second. So outside, they're, sub, uh, they're supersonic. And like I said before, the interstellar medium, which has particles in it, can exert a pressure on this pulsar wind as it travels through it, and it causes a bow shock to form. Uh, for example, when the Mach number is less than one, the structures are unaffected by the pulsar's motion. Uh, outside, if the pulsar is uh, only a mildly supersonic, the jets get bent back by this pressure, uh, and the bow shock forms, it takes on like a bullet-like shape, uh, and if the Mach number is much, much greater than one, all of the pulsar's wind just gets crushed and mixed together, and you can't really differentiate any of the structures. So, uh, there's about 10% about of the known pulsars have velocity that we've measured. Uh, we know about 30 fast moving pulsars that produce nebulous and x rays, and even fewer of which are seen in radio. Uh, and that's because uh, pulsars can only produce nebulae for their first one million years. After that, they are uh, emitting less energy per second, and they don't have enough potential to accelerate electrons to the energies needed to create more of them. And so they no longer, after that point, they don't produce any more plasma. So they just kind of turn off. Uh, the morphologies can be highly varied. We have filled and, and hollow bow shocks. Uh, we have compact nebulae or extended tails. Uh, sometimes we have a combined uh, compact nebula uh, and tail, or sometimes we have a tail without a nebula. Sometimes the tails bend, and much more, which I'll talk about in the following slides. Why do we study supersonic pulsar winds? Uh, they're easy to model because uh, they're essentially one dimensional structures. So we can model how the particles change as a function of distance from the pulsar. Uh, they're free from the messy interiors of supernova remnants. There's no uh, thermally emitting injecta or plasma to get in the way or absorb things. And it tells us about the interstellar medium, the density of it, the temperature of it, and how the magnetic field acts in a galaxy. They also tell us about supernova explosions, uh, because by studying the kick velocities and also the alignment between the pulsar spin axis and its velocity, we can tell how supernova form. Um, most of the pulsars we see have a uh, spin axis that's perpendicular to its jet velocity, but there are a couple cases where it doesn't always line up. So, uh, this pulsar on nebula is called the mouse because it looks like a mouse. Uh, I'm going to talk about this one because it's a classic example. It's very well behaved. Uh, it's moving at about 300 kilometers per second 
this direction, and it has the longest known tail. Uh, in radio, the tail stretches on for about 57 light years. Uh, in x-rays, if you zoom in on this area, you will see something like this. Uh, you can see it's bow shock, but it's much smaller. And why is that? Uh, the electrons that are emitting x-rays have much higher energy, so they cool much faster. The electrons that emit radio waves have much lower energies, so they cool at a slower rate, and they can last much, much longer. Um, so, um, in, this is the same x-ray image, I'm just changing the color here. But if you were to look at its spectrum, you know, this is just brightness, or the number of photons coming from each part of the nebula. As you can tell, the nebula decreased in brightness, but it's the color, per se, of the x-rays is also cooling. You know, here there's lots of high energy electrons, and here there's much fewer of them. Uh, this is a plot showing the spectrum. You know, higher numbers mean it's cooled just by convention. So, and that behaves as you would expect it to. Um, however, that's not always the case. Uh, this is another one called the Mushroom Pulsar Nebula because it looks like the cap and stem of mushroom. Uh, this is uh, about half a million years old, which is kind of old for pulsars. Uh, you see it has a compact nebula here, which is formed by the it's crushed torus, it gets pushed back, and its stem is formed from the jets, which get pushed back as well. Here's an illustration showing it. Uh, in this case, we're looking down into the jet, but then the jet gets bent back. Um, I have a question. Yeah. How do you estimate the, the age of the last pulsar? Oh, okay. So, uh, for pulsars and supernova remnants, it's easy because we can tell how big a supernova remnant is, uh, correlates with its, with its age. But for pulsars outside, uh, you need to determine its age, you need to measure its rotation period and how much that period is changing. You know, I said that there are very precise clocks, and they are. But um, over the course of many years, its period might slow down by like a billionth of a second or less. And with really precise electronics, we can determine a very slight amount of slowing of the rotational speed. So based on what its current period is right now, and how fast it's slowing down, we can back calculate its, or back estimate its age. These estimates, uh, while they're useful, are only good to within a factor of two. So it's pretty good. Uh, for astronomical estimates, it's factor of two is pretty good. But uh, you need to measure its rotation period and the rate at which its period is changing. And sometimes it can take 10 or 20 years to get those kind of measurements. So that is how we know. But good question. So uh, this one also doesn't appear to dim or fade with distance. Uh, you might say, but no, it does. But right here, this is the edge of the detector on Chandra, and the sensitivity naturally decreases as you get towards the edge, to, towards the edges. It, just like a vignetting effect with like old cameras, they get dimmer or towards the corner. But um, it doesn't appear to dim uh, after like seven light years, and its spectrum shows no signs of cooling with distance. Uh, so that's, that's odd. It doesn't behave how we expect it to. That suggests either the magnetic field is very low, like the same as the interstellar medium, which it shouldn't be because plasma has magnetic energy in it, or that the particles are being re-accelerated somehow, preventing them from uh, having any noticeable loss of energy. Uh, another one, J1509, uh, has another long radio tail, about 36 light years. Uh, its compact nebula is hollow, and that's because if you can imagine the previous one just rotated 90 degrees, we're looking at it uh, into the edge of its torus, but its torus is pushed back right there, and then the jets are also bent back. Um, uh, in this one, the jets are variable. We can see little blobs of plasma moving out from the pulsar and flowing along the jets at uh, a third speed of light. Now, uh, if we look at the spectrum here, it does some strange things. Uh, so here, I combined the X-ray and radio images. The green corresponds to X-rays, and the red is radio. But I'm going to go back to this one. If you notice, there's almost no radio emission coming from the pulsar wind itself. The radio emission only picks up at some distance away from the pulsar. And that coincides with the X-ray spectrum cooling. So as the X-rays emitting particles cool, they start creating, or they start emitting in lower energies of radio waves. 
Uh, now, what this is, is an image of radio polarimetry. Uh, as you know, light is polarized, uh, and with radio uh, telescopes, you can see the polarization of the light. But what does that mean? Uh, the polarization uh, reflects the direction of the magnetic field. So here, the magnetic field is kind of perpendicular to the tail axis, and it enhances here. But then something changes, and now the magnetic field switches directions for the rest of the tail. Uh, and that's also strange because at around the same point, the X-ray spectrum begins to harden again. So the amount of higher energy particles starts increasing, even though we're like tens of light years away from the pulsar. Uh, so this suggests that pulsar wind particles can become re-accelerated light years away from the pulsar. Uh, and that means that the energy stored in the magnetic field is somehow being converted back into the kinetic energy of the particles themselves. Could it be carrying an accretion disk along with it? Uh, I mean, a pulsar could have an accretion disk, but the accretion disk would have to be uh, near, the, near the pulsar, which is way up here. Uh, we're talking about changes light years away from oh, the wow. bottom ends of the tail. Oh, okay. But, uh, yeah, you'd also tell an accretion disk because you'd see the thermal oh. emission from it. But no, this is, I mean, light years away from the pulsar. Oh. Mag uh, magnetic fields are reconfiguring and reaccelerating the particles, which is not something we expect. A magnetic reconnection or something. Yeah, it, it must be, because also there's fewer lines here, which means magnetic fields are much weaker. So the magnetic fields are kind of uh, reconfiguring, restructuring themselves, and converting their energy <coughs> into uh, the particles. That's amazing. So uh, this is another nebula called the Guitar Nebula. If try to outline it, but it looks just like a guitar. Uh, you know, if you slide the guitar, it'll cover the nebula up completely, uh, and not any part of it gets knocked out. Uh, this is a very old pulsar, about a million years old. It's quite fast. It's nearby. Yeah, you can see it. kind of looks like a guitar. Anyway, uh, so this is H-alpha emission, which is uh, uh, like a, a spectral line of hydrogen. Uh, so the pulsar is here and it's moving that way. It's heating up the interstellar medium that ionizes the hydrogen, and then the hydrogen radiates at a specific frequency. Just the way that, like when you heat neon, all neon glows at that one specific red frequency. Uh, hydrogen and all gases do the same thing. And these bubble-like structures are caused because the pulsar is moving through regions of different density. In the low density medium, it can, uh, its wind can expand outwards and make a larger bubble, and in the lower density medium, can't inflate as much. So, if you look at this in x-rays, which are now overlaid in pink, something very strange is happening. Uh, you know, the pulsar's tail here is here, but all of its x-ray emitting particles are way off to the side, and it's completely misaligned from the direction of the motion. And that's really peculiar, because this should not happen. It defied everything we knew, or everything we thought about hydrodynamics. Um, so, I'll come back to this one. Uh, there's another uh, also a nebula called the Lighthouse Nebula. If you turn it that way, it looks like you know, a lighthouse and a beam coming out. Uh, 28,000 light years away, you can actually see its supernova remnant that it recently left, moving very fast, around 1,000 kilometers per second. Here we see, we see the wind particles confined to the bow shock here, but there's a small percentage of them that leak out and stream out to 53 light years away from the pulsar. So that was confusing. Uh, so it was originally proposed that these are just really powerful pulsar jets uh, that just break right through the bow shock and they're moving so fast that they're not affected by uh, the motion of the pulsar through the medium. Uh, there's a problem with this though, is that in uh, all pulsars, all other pulsar nebulae, where we see jets, the jets get bent back by their ram pressure. There's another problem with this, in that uh, I found a couple more of these structures in pulsar nebulae with jets. If you zoom in on J1509, the jets are right here. Uh, in the 0355, the jets are right there. And uh, in J1809, the jets, this is the, this is one, and this is zoomed in, you can see the other one varies. But, so these structures can't be the jets. So what are they? Uh, 
one theorist came up with the idea that if the gyration radius, the high energy electrons, is large enough, their radius of rotation will become larger than the standoff distance of the bow shock. And that will allow these particles to escape into the interstellar medium, which you're seeing there. Uh, the electrons would then travel along and illuminate the interstellar magnetic field lines. Uh, and, you know, the lower energy electrons would have their would stay within the bound shock and get uh, deflected by that ramp pressure. So the alignment, the misalignment between the pulsar's motion and these structures is just reflecting the seemingly random direction of the magnetic field happened to be in at that point in space. Um, we've learned more about these features, and uh, we've uh, learned that the pulsar wind can interact with the external interstellar medium magnetic field. Uh, the magnetic field can <coughs> seem to drape around the bow shock. Uh, I just drew this line to highlight it. Uh, and uh, theorists have done some modeling, and they showed that the magnetic field in the interstellar medium can reconnect with the one inside the pulsar wind nebula. And this uh, provides a clear, easy path for particles to escape the one. Uh, but from these images, uh, the outflows almost always seem to favor one side. And this kind of addresses that. Uh, reconnection, in order to have magnetic reconnection, you need to have magnetic fields that are pointed in opposite directions. If the magnetic fields are going the same way, they will not reconnect, they'll just compress. So when they're going the opposite direction, they reconfigure. So because this magnetic field is going in one direction, only one of the two sides will favor reconnection. And that is why they're not symmetric. Uh, what if the what happens if the pulsar is moving in an area with, in the same direction as the magnetic field? Then you could expect reconnection to occur on both sides, and this is an example of one such thing happening. It's called the snail pulsar and nebula. In green is X-rays here, and in red is radio, and that's its supernova remnant. But it looks like a snail. That's pretty cool. Um, so. Uh, this has shown that particles can leak out from the pulsar wind and escape to wherever they want, pretty much. Uh, this is interesting because for many years, uh, satellites in orbit have detected the excess of positrons, you know, the antiparticle electrons, coming from deep space. Uh, and then it's also uh, been discovered that uh, a nearby pulsar, and by nearby, I mean like 650 light years away, is the source of these particles. <coughs> so, even though they're very distant, we can still feel their winds here on Earth in measurable quantities. And uh, that, is, that is it.